Good afternoon, everyone. We are so glad that you are tuning in to this program with us. Uh, welcome to the Capital City Seven Day Adventist Church, a celebration of Black History program. We have come this far by faith, and so we certainly hope that um, each one of you that are tuning in, you know, don't hey, don't walk away from your device, don't walk away from your screen or what have you, because there's going to be so many things in this program that you're going to want to hear. It's going to be very important. And so we want you to just uh, stay tuned and be with us through this program. So thank you for joining us. And I didn't say it. I'm so sorry. My name is Chaplain Sherry Hedden, and we welcome you. And so I want to um, also just, you know, uh, acknowledge my co-host here, uh, Pastor Kevin Rogers. He is the pastor of the Capital City Seventh-day Adventist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. And so my co-host is on here with me, Pastor Rogers. All right. Hey, Sherry. Um, uh, it's been a good day so far. We had a great time with our celebration earlier today at church, but I'm so excited about this presentation today, and I'm glad that we could host this together, and we have some exciting um, things that will be shared today that will be a blessing to everybody. Now, um, to, if I could say a quick word to everyone, um, we want this to be interactive, okay? And so regardless of the platform that you're using, YouTube, Facebook, um, we want you to communicate with us in the chat, okay? So you can give your comments and like live feedback as it goes along. Um, and if right now, if those of you that are on, if you could just put where you're from, uh, we wanna acknowledge you right now. And as we go throughout this, you feel free to ask questions of our presenters and because there will be a Q&A time at the end of each presentation, okay? And so, um, at this point, we want to um, begin with prayer, and we are blessed to have Pastor Clifton McMillan to join us. He was our guest speaker at Capital City today uh, for our worship service, and we want to invite him to join us in offering prayer to uh, for us at this time. Let us pray. Loving Lord, our God, we thank you for your grace and your compassion, your love and your mercy, and most of all, we thank you for the privilege of sharing today. The Holy Spirit, Lord, bless this presentation. And Lord, may our hearts be touched by every movement of your spirit, and may we be actuated to do the right thing in times like these. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So right. at this time, um, you know, what we want to do is bring another uh, one of our panelists on, and this is a distinguished panelist. And I want to bring him on Elder Edward Woods III. He is the chairman of the Conscience and Justice Council, and he is also the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director of the Lake Region Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So we welcome him um, into the panel discussion and so glad that he is here. All right. Well, praise the Lord. We want to welcome all of you and we want to thank you for joining us today. What we want to do at the beginning of this is we have two very special presentations today dealing with the issues of um, voting. OK. And so before we go into any details, we want to pull back and ask a question that not assume that we're clear on on this particular issue. OK. And we want to know should Christians be concerned about voting? Should they be involved in voting or concerned about voting, how it's done and what happens re regarding voting? Um, whether, you know, from a biblical perspective, you know, should we, okay? Um, um, who wants to take a stab at that? I'm gonna I'm ask maybe uh, Woody, Ed, Edward Woods, and we affectionately call him Woody, um, if you could, uh, you know, at least address that at first. Well, you know, I, I, this always comes up with regards to voting and, um, you know, our Bible is very clear about um, consciousness. And I really believe we need to take a look at the Bible. Um, so many times you're trying to find something profound, something unique. And as much as I believe in the spirit of prophecy, you know, Ellen White says that she's the lesser light and the Bible is the greater light. And I think the Bible gives us some practical examples in Philippians 2, it really talks about doing within the best interest of others, not looking out for our own interests, but looking out for the interests of others. As many of you know, I grew up in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and Adventists got a bad reputation because we send our kids to church school. So when the millage came around to improve the public schools, even though some Adventists went to the public schools, we would vote the millage down 
because we don't want to see our property taxes um, increase. And I thought it was such an unfortunate incident that people were trying to persuade Adventists to invest in the local school districts and they refused to do so because they didn't want to see their taxes increase. Um, so, you know, stuff like that, I think we need to be very, very careful about the testimony that we have in terms of being about me, fi, me, and not looking out for the best interest of others. And so that would be a practical example, Pastor Rogers, that I would share with you with, with okay. a biblical example from Philippians 2. Okay, thank you, thank you. How about you, Pastor McMillan? Uh, can you share your thoughts on um, the Bible, any biblical principles or perspectives that can guide us in this? Well, I think there were two that are really, um, both of them in the Old Testament, but they are, um, they really discuss what it is to do unto do do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. One of them is Micah six eight to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. I think there's a responsibility for those that profess to be children of God to engage in any process necessary to make life better for those that are around them. Mm -hmm. And in times like these, voting is one tool one tool mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that can mm -hmm, help bring mm -hmm. out some sense of righteousness and justice in a world that is convoluted and confused. I think we cheat both ourselves, especially the way we talk about uh, religious freedom, for instance. Mm -hmm. You can't have religious freedom if you don't vote for other things that will help to um, strengthen those laws and those policies as they are passed. So voting, mm -hmm. I think, is not only a responsibility, but also it, it speaks to Isaiah 58 as well, where mm -hmm. as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we have a responsibility to be advocate for the least, the last, the lost, and left behind. So if we don't use okay. the one tool that we have that can help uh, others do better, then I think we are cheating God and those around us from an opportunity to be relevant and to have a positive perspective on what's going on in our community. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chaplain Head, anything you want to add to this, what has been shared before? Yeah, just, um, you know, of course, definitely, uh, you know, regarding, you know, what, you know, Elder Wood shared, what Pastor McMillan shared. I mean, those are powerful examples. There's so many uh, biblical passages, there's so many biblical texts that, you know, talk about, you know, justice, you know, God is a God of justice and how we are, you know, to live that out. I mean, you have, you know, Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke uh, the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Psalm 82, three, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless. Okay, you're preaching now, widow. you're preaching now, I mean, but go ahead, so go many, ahead. There's so many that, that yeah, I mean, yeah, we yeah. can talk about, you know, when, what, what Jesus, you know, said himself in Luke 4, um, 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is yeah. upon me and that he is anointed to preach the gospel and to, you know, release those who are, you know, captive and all of that. So there's a lot of texts that are there and they're plainly there in scripture. And, and you know, that's what we are called to do. We are called yeah, to yeah, do yeah. that. You, we're called to do that, definitely. Um, I don't know if though, those who may be tuning in that didn't, uh, maybe didn't have an opportunity to hear Pastor McMillan's um, sermon earlier this afternoon that was very powerful, but he talked about seeking the invisible so that we can do the impossible. So speaking, coming Amen. into contact with the spirit of God so that we can do the impossible. And I think when we are really in contact with the spirit of God, when the Holy Spirit is working within us, then these mm -hmm. effects come to life within our hearts and our minds and we live them out. All right. Thank you for sharing that. I just want to throw this out uh, before we move on here. But the Bible says we need to be salt in the world. It also says render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God's the things that are God's. Right. And, and we know that God is a God of freedom. And this country was set up and built on the principle of freedom. OK. And the way that the process that has been set up for us to be involved and to, to, uh, to use our freedoms to be involved in the selection of leaders and the formation of our laws is the voting process. And so Caesar, is, we, if we're going to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, then we need to be involved in, in our civic responsibilities. It is part of our Christian duty to be in the world and to make it a better place. And so um, uh, with that in mind, 
we're going to move into some details right now. And I'm going to ask uh, Chaplain Hedden if you would um, 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 at this point introduce um, a little more um, um, Brother Woody and um, the presentation he's going to share at this time. Yeah, yeah, just again, you know, just, um, you know, so glad that Elder Woods is joining us today in um, this program. And so, you know, Elder Woods, we're uh, wanting to, you know, we're wanting to talk about what has been going on with the um, changes in the election laws. I mean, for for decades now, talking about African-Americans specifically, we have constantly um, you know, had to fight in so many ways just to have, you know, basic, you know, voting rights and just to be able to, you know, get ahead and have things on an equal plane. And even if we even as we looked at this last election and how there were major um, there were there were cities where there were large populations of African-American voters who voted. And there was this threat of trying to discount those votes. And just different things that are happening across the political landscape. And so we just wanted to open up the floor to you to, um, you know, just just let us know what is what is going on and what should we be aware of when it comes to the changes in our election laws? Well, you know, despite um, Chaplin had the um, notion that people believe America was, was, you know, a Christian country and born of freedom. The reality is women just now, 100 years later have full access to the ballot. You know, people of color, you know, maybe 60 to 80, you know, with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, as a whole in this country in the 60s, have actually gotten access to the vote. So although we may have been founded, you know, with our Declaration of Independence in the 1700s, mm -hmm. the reality is for some of us women, it's been only been about 100 years. And for people of color as a whole across this country, it really wasn't until the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And so what has happened, as you mentioned, um, over the last few years, I mean, over this last election, we have seen um, votes trying to be discounted. We have seen um, ways to discount votes. We've seen, you know, requests and IDs. We've seen an increase in the minority votes and now suppression to try to do it. So this brief presentation that I have really shares about what is taking place with voting as it relates across this country. But for this presentation, I would really like to share with you what is taking place as relates to African, um, as relates around this conference. I think that would be something that would be important. Um, this information that I would like to share comes from the Brennan Center for Justice. And this is a voting laws roundup 2021 a voting rounds law, law um, roundup from 2021. And what it says as of February 3rd, 2020, 33 states, let me say it again, 33 states have introduced, pre-filed, or carried over 165 restrictive bills this year. Comparing this to 35 bills in 15 states on February 3rd. So in other words, 33 states we had in 2021. In 2020, it was just 15 states. On February 3rd, 2020, it was 35 bills. And in February, this report came out February 11th, 2021, around that time, mid-February, there's 165 restrictive bills. You can imagine where they're upset at is in Georgia. You're not probably not surprised that they're upset in Georgia. They're upset about Arizona. They're upset about Pennsylvania and they're upset in Michigan. I'm sure you are not surprised. However, 37 states have introduced, pre filed, or carried over 541 bills to expand voting access compared to the 188 expansive bills in 29 states on February 3rd, 2020. So, in other words, this is, and this is good news. This is good news is that 33 states have introduced our pre-file. So we've gone from 29 states to 37 states that wants to expand access to the polls. However, we've also gone from 188 to 541 bills. So you can see both parties are working, obviously the Republicans to restrict and the Democrats to expand. 
but you should not be surprised if there's bipartisan support as it relates to this legislation. So what does this mean? Let's take a look at this. Um, Michigan, when we look, take a look at Michigan in particular, um, oh, this is what I want to share with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to this one. Um, one of the things that they're trying to do when it comes to restrictions, when we talk about restrictive bills, they're trying to have restrictions on mail vote on mail voting. They are doing this in stricter voting identification in Minnesota. They want to slash voting registration opportunities and make um, proof of citizenship a possibility in Indiana, right there in your state. They want to reduce the amount of voter registration opportunities and they want to require proof of citizenship. This is in Indiana. In my state of Michigan, they want to have a more aggressive voter purge practices in terms of how can we purge people and prevent them from the opportunity to vote. The good news is the expansion of voting in the Lake Region Conference area has more bills being introduced than the restriction of voting. Um, they want to do mail voting in Indiana. They want to have drop boxes in Indiana. And also in Indiana, they want to process ballots before election day. So instead of having to count all the ballots on election day, they want to be able to process ballots before election day. Um, also in Indiana, which is good news, they want to have early voting and they want to enlarge the um, existing early voting period and increase the number of sites. This is good news in Indiana. They want to enlarge the existing voting, early voting period and increase the number of sites for voter access. This is in Indiana. Minnesota is introducing this same concept for the first time. Also in Indiana, which is good news, they want to have easier voter registration where you can have same day registration. In other words, on election day, you can register to vote and then also vote. This is something good in Indiana. They also want to have automatic voter registration as it relates to your license. So when you go in to renew your license or when you turn 18, if you have a license, you're automatically registered to vote. They want to do the same thing in Minnesota. And then in also Minnesota, if you are convicted of a felony and you have spent your time, um, you've done your time, they want to make sure that they restore the rights that are available to you. Going to our next slide, where we look at Michigan and Wisconsin, um, they reduce their risk for gerrymandering or unfair maps. When you see IC, that stands for Independent Commission. And when you see DG, that stands for Divided Government. And what Michigan and Wisconsin did as a result, you know, after the census, you start doing your, your lines for your state Senate, your state house, and your congressional district. And what Michigan and Wisconsin did to reduce their risk is Michigan introduced an independent citizens um, redistricting commission and Wisconsin went from um, the party in control or SP, sole party, to a divided government. And so what that did was that reduced their risk for gerrymandering or the creation of unfair maps. Illinois is on the watch list is because of there's a Democrat control and they're concerned about gerrymandering and favoring the Democrats. Indiana is also on the watch list because they are also concerned about Republican control and gerrymandering the districts as a result of that. Minnesota has a divided government. Um, they're worried about losing a congressional seat in Illinois, Michigan, and Minnesota because of population changes in terms of a decrease in population. They expect them to lose a congressional seat. The amount of increase of voting as it relates to minority populations was 100% in Illinois is what's going to happen in the 21-22 landscape. 83% increase in Michigan, 63% increase in Wisconsin, and 59% increase in Indiana and Minnesota. So I wanted to just share with you some of the updates and the changes as a result of voting, but also redistricting, and want to encourage you to get involved in the process and make sure your voice is heard, but also the voice of the disenfranchised, the least of these, the count out, the marginalized and the ostracized, that they have as much access to the polls as possible. So I encourage you to follow the legislation as it moves through your state house and state Senate. 
Once again, I want to thank um, Pastor Rogers and Chaplain Hedden for this opportunity to be a part of your broadcast. Capital City holds a special place in my heart, and I miss you guys, but I'm glad we're able to connect virtually and be a blessing. Pastor Rogers. Thank you so much, Woody. We appreciate it. And I just have a question. If people want to get involved, they uh, want to have, you know, express concerns, how, how should they do that? They should write letters to their state representative and their state senator supporting the legislation to expand access to the polls. They definitely want to write and, ex and express, you know, with, um, to express, um, I want to see voting expanded. I want to see more people have the rights to vote. And also, you also want to be careful with regards to the gerrymandering. You want to declare that it become an open process. You don't want something in the back doors. And you want to make sure communities aren't being split to favor one party or another. So you want to demand that you have an open and fair process when it comes to redistricting. And I would encourage you, encourage you, I can't stress enough, to write your legislature, legislators in your state legislature. And what's so funny, Pastor Rogers, is if they hear about the issue, it's five times at the federal level, but 10 times at the state, they tend to jump on it because they're not used to getting a lot of citizen concerns. They're used to oh. hearing from lobbyists, but they're not used to hearing from voters. And if voters, voters can vote for them, lobbyists can fund them. Let me say this again, voters keep them in office. Hmm. Lobbyists just funds them while they're in office. And if the voters rise up and they speak out along with the pastor and your leaders, you can make a difference in your area, regardless of the political landscape, because people do want to stay in office. Okay. Thank you so much, um, uh, Edward Woods III. He is a public affairs and religious liberty director for Lake Region Conference. Thank you so much for this um, um, timely information. Thank you. Um, now, as we prepare for our keynote presentation, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, the person that we'll be sharing today. His name is Robert Bennett, and he is um, an attorney. He received his education at Dartmouth College and graduated in 1969. And in 1974, he graduated from Yale Law School. And we praise God for that. As a lawyer from 1976 through 2010, he practiced in Chicago and his practice was in commercial matters and civil litigation. Okay, he handled matters in 10 states and three foreign countries, Canada, Lesotho, and Honduras. I gotta look that, that country up, Lesotho, okay. And a final, a noteworthy trial he handled involved whether or not Chicago Transit Authority should install hydraulic lifts on its buses to provide access to the physically disabled, okay? Now, he has had some enormous international consulting practice in Africa, okay? He represented Chevron Overseas, um, the Petroleum Corporation in development of the West African Gas Pipeline, which spans Nigeria, Benin, Togo, and Ghana. And he represented Sony Columbia Pictures in the filming of Ghana, Ghana in, the, in the movie Ali, which starred Will Smith. And some of you may have seen that. I enjoyed that movie myself. Now in Africa, he was an honorary counsel um, general of Ghana to Chicago from 1996 to 2002. He was also an observer at the constitutional negotiations for the new South Africa in May, 15 and 16, 1992 in Johannesburg, South Africa. And he participated in many activities in South Africa as the African National Congress um, supporter of which Nelson Mandela was president. He also hosted four African presidents in the United States. Nelson Mandela, Jerry uh, John Rawlings, president of Ghana, uh, John Evans Atta Mills, president of Ghana, and Julius Maada Bio, president of Sierra Leone, and he's traveled to 25 African countries. So um, uh, we praise God for the wealth of experience that um, Mr. Bennett has had um, in, in serving people directly in, in African countries. In 1989, he became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church 
and he currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia, and attends the West End Seventh Day Adventist Church. And we are really honored to have um, Attorney Robert Bennett to be our our keynote presenter uh, today and to share a presentation that has been entitled The Electoral College, A Legacy of Slavery. Welcome, um, Mr. Bennett. We are honored to have you. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Rogers, uh, for the introduction. And also thank you for giving me this opportunity to be on the program and to speak about the sure. Electoral College, A Legacy yeah. of Slavery. Let me just briefly say that um, as far as biblical um, authority for uh, participating in elections or in, in the political process, um, uh, an additional biblical authority I think that we can mention and be and rely on is the second of the two great commandments. The first of the great com greatest commandments, of course, is to love God. Uh, put God first and foremost in all that we do. Second uh, great commandment is to love thy neighbor, as was said earlier. And in loving thy neighbor, that means uh, uplifting people to the extent that we can. And just as an example, take the $15 an hour minimum wage. If that is on the ballot, uh, that is whether or not people should, as a minimum, make $15 an hour, uh, why wouldn't we vote for that? Uh, huge numbers of our people, black people, uh, work below the minimum wage and have full-time jobs that pay them far less than $15 an hour. And as a result of that, they work full-time and live in poverty. So participating, let's say in a ballot, that allows for our people uh, and others who make less than $15 an hour, let's vote for that. That makes sense. That's consistent with the second of the greatest commandments. The Electoral College, a legacy of slavery. First off, this is an example of how impossible it is to separate black history and white history in the United States. It's not possible to talk about white history, so-called white history in the United States without talking about black history in the United States. It's not possible to vice versa. The two are so intertwined throughout the history of the United States that to talk about black history is to talk about the history of the United States. And the Electoral College is a fine example of that. We must know and tell the truth of yesterday's story so that our present will be unburdened by yesterday's story and our future made new. On February, excuse me, January 6th, just last month, President Trump's followers, at his urging, attacked the United States Capitol to try to stop the presidential electors from their vote for president from being certified or validated by the United States Congress. The presidency is the most powerful office in the United States by far. President Trump wanted to remain in office even though he did not win the popular vote. He lost the popular vote in this year's election or last year's election by over 10 million votes. But still, he tried to pressure state leaders in certain key states Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Georgia to create enough popular votes for him so that he could have enough votes to win the electoral vote in the United States Congress. He was unable to do that. 
and take note of the states that he sought to make these, this, put this pressure, where he sought to put this pressure. Michigan, in other words, the heavily black area of Detroit, Pennsylvania, the heavily black area of Philadelphia, Wisconsin, the heavily black areas of both Milwaukee and Kenosha, Wisconsin, and the state of Georgia, the heavily black areas in Atlanta. Black people have always been the bogeyman for problems in the United States. We're to blame. So President Trump, former President Trump said, there was corruption in these areas. The mail-in ballots were corrupt. Signature is not proper, not verified. That became the rationale for his efforts to overturn the popular vote in those states. And thus, in his mind, bringing about a change in the Electoral College, the mechanism by which the President of the United States is elected. President of the United States is not elected by direct popular vote. What do I mean by direct popular vote? The governors of each state, for example, are elected by direct popular vote. Every vote counts. That is, every vote is counted and every counted vote matters. In the election for the president of the United States, every vote is counted, but not every counted vote matters. This is so because the electoral college is the mechanism by which the president of the United States is directly elected. What are the origins of the electoral college? I attended Yale Law School and one of the required courses at Yale is constitutional law. The professor who taught our class in constitutional law, he emphasized that the electoral college was designed to balance big population states and small population states, to create a balance of power between the two. I could say that's a myth, which is true, but more accurately, it's a lie. The Electoral College was created to maintain or keep, preserve slavery, the enslavement of our ancestors. As far as the big college, small state college explanation, Please note that there have been 46 presidents in the history of the United States, including our current president, Joe Biden. Of those 46 presidents, 42 have been from big population states. Only four have been from small states, small population states. Two of these presidents, took office before the Civil War in 18, that is the Civil War in 1861. Two presidents were from small states after the Civil War, which ended in 1865. The two presidents who were from small states before the Civil War were Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire and Zachary Taylor of Louisiana. The two presidents from small states since the Civil War were Bill Clinton of Arkansas and 
our current president, Joe Biden from Delaware, just four out of 46 from small states. Why protect slavery? And why protect it through the organizational document for the national government of the United States? That's the constitution. Why? Because slavery was the foundation of the American economy. It was the American economy. In a document or a statement which I wrote for my church here in Atlanta, the West End Seventh-day Adventist Church, commemorating the year 1619, when our ancestors first arrived here in the United States as slaves, this is what I said about the importance of slavery to the United States. And I'll read it quickly, but this document I believe is made a part of this program, so you may be able to take a look at it, but I'm gonna read it quite quickly. Our enslavement produced an entirely new era in human history. The birth of capitalism as an economic system and in many new kinds of institutions which sustain capitalism, mass production factories, widespread large scale cities, modern banking, and mass access to machine produced transportation such as railroads and steamships, etc. Moreover, slavery produced a considerably enlarged and transformed class of super wealthy white people in America. Europe, South Africa, excuse me, South America, and the West Indies. This surplus capital produced by slavery and owned by this elite class of white people was used by them, number one, to invest in or finance and implement the many societal transforming inventions of the early capitalist era in the late 1700s, the 1800s, and the early 1900s the cotton gin, the steam engine, railroads, steamships, the telegraph, etc. This surplus capital produced by slavery also enabled these super wealthy white people to found or create, enhance or build some of the most prominent social institution in the United States. Universities such as Harvard, Brown University, Dartmouth College, Williams College, John Hopkins University, big hospitals such as Massachusetts General Hospital, the big churches and cathedrals in the United States, and also to build many of the great estates, royal palaces, mansions in Britain, France, Portugal, Spain, and the United States. Finally, this transformed class of the super wealthy white elite became the governing class of their countries, replacing the monarchies and feudal elites which preceded them. In America, the English King George III was replaced by the rich slave owners of Virginia and the rest of the South and the rich elite, business elite of New England and the mid-Atlantic states. So slavery, our enslavement was central, was pivotal, the development of the United States. So it was essential to protect the economy of the United States in the drafting of the Constitution. And the economy was based on slavery. The United States Constitution was drafted in 1787 and it was ratified in 1789. That is approved in 1789 by the various states in the United States, the 13 at that time, 13 states. And as I said earlier, in the Constitution, the point was, fundamental to the Constitution, the point was to protect its economy. In addition to all else that the Constitution did, the basic premise was protect the foundation what made it the United States possible in terms of its economy. That was the enslavement of our ancestors. The total white population of each state 
was the basis of each state's representation in the new national government established after the war of independence against the British in 1776. This is all in the constitution. The total white population of the free Northern states in 1787 was greater than the total white population of the Southern slave states. All of the states, North and South, had been slave states. But after the War of Independence against the British, all the Northern states enacted laws which gradually freed their slaves. So that the Northern states were now, in the late 1780s, free states. To protect slavery, to protect and preserve slavery, the men who wrote the U.S. Constitution wrote in the very first article of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, that each slave is three-fifths of a white person for the purpose of determining the total white population of a slave state. If you look, if one looks at Article 1, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, the language is still there. Still there, even though it's, we're considered 100% human being, the language that at one time made us three-fifths of a human being is still in the Constitution. The three-fifth clause greatly increased the total white population of the Southern slave states. Some Southern states had more slaves than white people. For example, at one point, 90% of South Carolina's population were slaves. Georgia, about one half. And throughout the South, the numbers of slaves were huge numbers. Half. Slightly more than half. Even today, the descendants of the slaves represent large numbers of the population of Southern states. Here in Georgia, for example, we're still maybe 45, 46% of the population of Georgia. And that holds true throughout the South. In Texas, big state like Texas, 35% or so of the state population are, is descended from slaves. For the election, of the president in the United States, as I said earlier, the most powerful office in the United States, there was not direct e popular election from the very beginning. Even for the election of US senators, there was not direct popular election. US senators were selected, selected by the legislatures of each state. Popular direct voting of US senators was not allowed or not permitted until 1913, 125 years after the Constitution was written. For the election of president, each state, according to the Constitution, was assigned a total number of electors, presidential electors, based on its total white population. Pennsylvania, for example, was a big white population state, but it had no slaves at the time the Constitution was written. Slaves were, as I said earlier, were gradually being freed. In some instances, law enacted to free the slaves in the 1780s, early 1780s, soon after the War of Independence against the British. But freedom didn't take place until the 1820s. But still, they were considered free states because they had agreed to free the slaves. Virginia had a total white population that was 10% less than the white population of Pennsylvania. But when Virginia's slave population, which was the biggest in the South, when Virginia's slave population was counted as three-fifths of a white person, 
Virginia had 20% more electoral votes for president than Pennsylvania. In 1787, 1789, through that period, the total number of electoral votes for all the states combined was 91. To elect the president at that time, 46 electoral votes was required. Virginia, the state with the biggest slave population, had 12 electoral votes, one-fourth of the total number of 46 electoral votes that were needed to elect the president. The slave states combined had enough electoral votes to elect the president without any electoral votes from the northern states. In other words, the electoral college was a firewall if you will, to prevent the big white population states of the North from selecting a president who opposed slavery. Virginia as a slave state with the largest number of slaves was the most dominant of the slave states. In fact, it was the most dominant state in the Union, in the United States, given its dominance is in terms of the slave population. An example of Virginia's dominance. Virginia slave owners, starting with George Washington, won eight of the United States' first nine presidential elections. Of the first 15 presidents of the United States, the majority of them were slave owners. None of the first 15 advanced freedom for the slaves. The 16th president of the United States was Abraham Lincoln. He did not advocate freedom for the slaves either. He was not opposed to slavery in the South. He opposed the expansion of slavery into the new territories or new land stolen from the Native Americans. Lincoln in, eight, in, the, in the 1860 election received some popular vote in Virginia. He was on the ballot in Virginia, but of course he did not win the popular vote in, in Virginia. Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in any other Southern state. Lincoln stands against slavery's expansion was a South rationale for succeeding from the United States and forming its own country, which they call the Confederate States of America. Richmond, Virginia became the capital of their new country. Initially at the beginning, Montgomery, Alabama was the capital, but after a very brief period of time, the capital was moved to of the Confederate States of America was removed, was moved to Richmond, Virginia. And Richmond, Virginia remained the capital for the four years of the independence of the Confederate States of America. <clears throat> the only way for the South to keep or preserve slavery was to expand slavery. Electoral votes for the South were contingent or dependent on ever increasing numbers of slaves whether they were imported or forcibly bred by the slave owners. Extra slaves meant extra electoral college votes. Poor white people immigrating to the United States at that time, they would not and did not settle in the slave owning states. That is these poor white people coming from Ireland, as an example, where the potato family was raging and killing up to think two million people in Ireland. These people came to, many of these people immigrated, survivors immigrated to the United States. They didn't immigrate to the South. They immigrated to the Northern states. They did not immigrate to the South because the slave economy was so dominant in the South, most white people in the South were poor, very poor, with little or no opportunity for advancement. Examples of the Electoral College 
as the deciding mechanism for election or selection of the president of the United States. Two examples, the election of 1800 and 1801. This is after two terms of President George Washington and one term of the second president of the United States, John Adams. John Adams and his runner mate ran against Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. At the time of that election, there were not political parties in the United States. And when voting took place, there was no distinction between who was going to be president on a particular two candidates and who was going to be the vice president. So Jefferson and Burr ran on a ticket against Adams and his running mate. There was a tie in the electoral college vote between Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Jefferson received 73, they received, a, both received a majority together, a majority of electoral votes. Well, each received a majority of electoral votes, but they had a tie of 73 votes, electoral votes each. So who's to be the president and who's to be the vice president? Thomas Jefferson was from Virginia, Aaron Burr from New Jersey. So who became the president? Thomas Jefferson. Virginia was determined to protect its interests, slave and owner interests, and that of the remaining states of the South. So Thomas Jefferson became the third president of the United States and John Adams and his followers so disgusted, they called Jefferson the Negro president. And John Adams was the first president of the United States not to attend his successor's inauguration. A second example of the electoral college being the deciding mechanism for the selection of the president of the United States is the election of 1876. Two candidates, Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican candidate, and Samuel Tilden from the Democratic Party. Tilden won the popular vote by 250,000 votes. And at the beginning, at the initially, Tilden had, he had 184 electoral votes. Hayes only had 165 electoral votes. But there were 20 disputed electoral votes from Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. And also one from Oregon. There was a question in Oregon about whether or not the presidential elector and electoral college from Oregon was an, uh, an, uh, an official or an appointee. And the, elect, the Constitution says that a presidential elector cannot be an official or, uh, an, or uh, an elected official or appointed official. But in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, there had been tremendous violence against Black people in the South during the Reconstruction era, as we were given a chance, a decent opportunity to have real opportunity in America, equal opportunity in America, the whites reacted violently against it, Southern whites, the former slave owners with founding the Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist groups. They disrupted the election process throughout the South. So Virginia, excuse me, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina had these disputed ballots, so-called disputed, meaning that the old Southern slave owners were claiming that their guy won and that the black vote didn't count or shouldn't be counted. So Tilden, Samuel Tilden and Hayes 
made a deal with each other to use the electoral college to make Hayes the president, even though he had 250, even though he didn't win the popular vote, and even though he had fewer electoral votes than Tilden. The deal was, if Hayes would end Reconstruction in the South and remove the federal troops that were occupying the South, and by the way, huge numbers of these federal troops occupying the South after the Civil War, protecting black people's right to vote and to live in dignity were African-American soldiers. So Hayes said, okay, if I get your electoral votes, the remaining 20 electoral votes, then I will end Reconstruction and I'll move the federal troops. So those 20 electoral votes, the 20 presidential electors, they decided, notwithstanding what the pop, national popular vote was, they decided to back Hayes. There have been five presidential elections in the United States history in which the candidate who won the most popular votes did not win the election. The election of 1824, the election of 1876, Rutherford P. Hayes, as I just described, 1888, and two very recently in our lifetime. In the year 2000, George Bush did not win the popular vote. Al Gore won the popular vote by 500,000, approximately. George Bush won the Electoral College. In 2016, the man who lost the popular vote but won in the Electoral College was Donald Trump. The United States Constitution does not require states to even hold a popular vote. The legislature of a state could assign electors without regard to the popular vote or if no popular vote was even conducted. In a given state, it doesn't matter. This is today, how many people vote for president. State of California example, 40 million people, 55 electoral votes. 10 million people could vote. The electoral college vote stayed the same. One million. Electoral college vote doesn't change. 55 electoral votes. Or even 1,000 people. Doesn't matter. Electoral college vote stays exactly the same. So it doesn't matter how many people directly vote for president of the United States. It's the Electoral College which selects the President of the United States. And Trump knew that. If he could get electors to change their mind about, that is to change the mind or to vote for him, notwithstanding what the popular vote total was, he would be president. And that's what he tried to do. The Electoral College, as I said earlier, is a firewall, was a firewall to prevent northern states from ending slavery. Today, the Electoral College serves as a firewall to prevent any fundamental change in the economy and the governance of the United States. A socialist, for example, who's opposed to capitalism the Electoral College is that firewall that the ruling elites in the United States can use to block that socialist candidate from becoming president of the United States, even though he or she might win or have won the popular vote. Okay, for questions.
All right. We want to thank you so much for um, sharing such <laughs> insightful information. Um, wow, 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 wow. Okay, Chaplain Hedden. All right. Now, listen, we want to certainly have a, a discussion on this and feedback. And we want you to know, um, for those of you that have been listening, this is really something. I've never heard this before in this way. Um, and I've taken American history in high school, college, and everything, right? Um, um, so we want you to, if you have questions, please put that in the chat um, and um, we'll be able to field your questions. Uh, Chaplain Hedden? Uh, yeah, just yeah, just just repeating that. If if there are questions that you have, um, please put your questions in the chat, and uh, we will get to as many of the questions as we can. So yeah, if there's something that you just you know, because I can say the same. Some of those, a lot of those details were not taught in our basic, you know, um, history classes, and so there may be questions that you have. Please put it in the chat, and then also, you know, this is a time for you know, as, as the panel, you know, if there is, um, you know, a reaction or feedback or a question that we have as the panel, you know, this is a time to bring that question out, you know, ask that question while we have um, Attorney Bennett here, um, you know, please, you know, definitely go for it if there's a question that one of our panelists have, and also okay. we're going to get into the questions in the chat. Okay, okay. I'd like us to just for those of us on the panel here yeah, okay. to give your reaction to what you heard, okay, um, to this material. What stood out to you? What, um, okay, could I step away for one, one second? Sure, sure, right. sure, sure. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's talk about this briefly. What stood out to you guys um, from this presentation? Wow, this is heavy stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. And yeah. um, um, uh, what stood out to you? Well, you know, I, I would say well, for, for me, I was okay. Go ahead, uh, Pastor McMillan. Go ahead, Chaplain. Head. Go ahead, Chaplain. Head. Go on. Um, you know, I would say ahead, for Chaplain. me, <laughs> you know, for me, um, you know, the under recognizing that the origin of the Electoral College is directly linked to the fact um, that you know, for the Southern states, the Southern slave states. Uh, to be able to have, um, you know, to, to be able to to have more of that dominant uh, voting power, you know, for who is going to be the president of the United States. So for me, you know, just becoming aware of that history within itself is, um, yeah, that's eye opening. And then thinking about what does that mean for today, you know, in the mm -hmm. present. Realizing mm -hmm. that the Electoral College has its legacy in, um, you know, for the Southern states to to have uh, the prominence. Okay, okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. I wish uh, Pastor McMillan your reaction to the presentation. Well, I was really um, it would it would definitely illuminate a little bit more. I was aware of that Southern connection mm -hmm. and the relationship between the North and the South trying to sustain uh, slavery. Often we've been taught mythologies, and so I really appreciated that uh, attorney. I guess my question would be, uh, how do you abolish the Electoral College? Because I don't even know how people are elected to it. And I've been doing activism for many years now, and I'm still confused as to how they actually elect those that are part of the Electoral College. OK. Should I respond? Yes, please do. Please do. They're not elected. <laughs> Nobody knows who they are except the powerful people who appoint them. They're never on a ballot. Wow. I don't know who they are in Georgia. When I lived in Illinois, I had no idea who they were. My guess is all of us on this call, none of us, all of us on this call, none of us know who the electors, presidential electors in, this, in our respective states are. Um, they don't campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, now on that on that point, um, I was looking into this some time ago, and what I saw is that every state has its own rules for how the electoral college is selected in that state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some many states have kind of a policy where each each party um, they come up with people that they would choose to be their electors if they win the popular vote, and so it's almost as if that 
party has their they choose who their electors are going to be if they win the popular vote and but it, it changes from state to state and i don't know right. um uh, you know someone would have to do a research literally of every state to see what exists okay we do have a question that has come in and then um, let from, me say too that yeah uh, go ahead uh there's nothing uh ironclad about forcing an elector to vote for whomever that elector has pledged to vote for yeah you're right uh, right. When Bush was declared uh, the winner of the president election in two, year 2000, some electors, as a protest, voted for Al Gore. Mm. Wow. They were not. Actually, proud. you're actually answering the question that was raised, which is Does uh -huh. the electorate have the responsibility to vote in line with the popular vote? No. Um, actually, I, I don't, I didn't don't have those details in front of me, but there were some people recently in a recent election that for president where they voted differently than um, than the popular vote yeah. in, in a couple of states. And I remember seeing these people online as they were talking about it. And 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 that's one of the challenges because you most of our country, this information is most people are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. We're in the dark and we really think that the popular vote actually is the one that determines the presidency. And, and that, that can really work negatively because um, it, it can create a lot of despondency because we feel that our votes really count. You know what I'm saying? And um, you, I love the way that you broke it down about direct versus, you know, for local officials. And now even for senators, now we have direct votes, but for the president, it's not. And so um, this can be something that can be very discouraging, especially to young people when we are encouraging them to vote and we're saying, you know, your vote counts and all like this. You know, this this younger generation now, um, they can be they can um, um, also um, be discouraged because they, they they really don't understand this process. And when they, a person wins the electoral, the, the, the popular vote um, and then the question is, um, you know, when they that doesn't they not put in office, then that can create a problem. Now, another question that's coming from Alex. He had difficulty, I guess, putting it in the chat. I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. Um, here, here is his question: um, How is the Electoral College still keeping slavery, um, modern or otherwise, currently in this age, given that presidents swing from one party to another pretty much over every voting cycle? OK, so we you know, you, we, you gave us the roots of it, um, I guess. How is that fitting into the whole issue of race? You know, but he's just in terms of slavery. But how is it affecting race even today? Okay? The, the Electoral College is designed to protect and maintain the prevailing economic system and governing system in the United States. Every candidate, major candidate, that is party candidate, must adhere or show loyalty to those basic principles in order to move forward or even to be nominated. Every single candidate or nominee of the major parties have demonstrated and do demonstrate that loyalty to their base, that basic principle. That is to preserve and maintain the, pre the prevailing economic and governing structure of the United States. So that's how the Electoral College continues to be relevant today. And um, as far as Democratic Party, Republican Party, it doesn't matter which party it is. As long as that candidate is there, I mean, expresses that loyalty to those basic principles, he's okay, or she's okay. Mm. But if you have a socialist <laughs> who opposed to both the prevailing economic structure and governance structure of the United States, it's almost certain, well, I put it that way, the Electoral College is there to keep the billionaires in power. Wow. Oh. <laughs> wow. Attorney Bennett, can you um, explain, I mean, I've heard talk of this winner takes all system that I guess some states, you know, have in place. Um, and I don't know if that's, you know, I guess supposedly electors would, um, if it is, if the popular vote in that state is, you know, for a particular candidate, 
then the electors would, um, you know, vote in that way. Um, I'm un I'm unsure what that winner takes all uh, system is about. Well, almost all time, the electoral college, uh, presidential electors, they vote for the candidate who wins the most popular vote. Okay. Easily so. The electoral college is a firewall or a circuit breaker. In other words, if something goes wrong, the whole process is shut down. In your house, you have a circuit breaker. There's one uh, faulty uh, wiring in some part of the house or whatever. Then there's a circuit breaker which shuts down the whole process of el electrifying your home. Or a firewall, if there's a fire someplace in a building, okay? To keep the fire from engulfing the entire building, you close that firewall, that door that shuts off the fire, keeps the oxygen from getting to the fire. Same with the electoral college. It doesn't come into play in terms of its most controversial way unless there's a threat to the prevailing system. Mm. Most uh, election, presidential elections, the electoral college votes with the um, winner of the popular vote. No problem whatsoever. So winner take all, the state may say, yes, winner take all. That's not a problem. Uh, that's our, uh, state of Georgia might say winner takes all. That's our policy for electors. New York may say, well, or <clears throat> we'll go by district. Whoever wins in a particular district of New York or a section or area of New York, they get a percentage of the electoral vote. All of that's okay. No problem. The electoral college is there if there's a threat mm. to the system itself. Like there when slavery, if there was a threat to slavery, the prevailing economic system at that time, the prevailing governance system of that time, if there was a threat to that system, freeing our ancestors, ending slavery, the electoral college will come into play mm. to terminate or end that threat, to block that threat. Mm. It's the same today. Most candidates are no threat. Sure, to reform the system, that's not a problem. It needs reform. <laughs> Billionaires don't mind giving up some of their money. Mm -hmm. Hmm. They're going to give up all of well, Do you think that there might come a time since this will require a constitutional change, right? For 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 this to be different, um, do you think that there might come a time when um, um, that may actually happen? That the electoral college may be. It depends on the uh, mass movement of people in the United States. In other words, uh, um, God, uh, our ancestors were slaves for two hundred forty-six years. I mean, that's a that's a long, long, long time. It's hard to imagine such a long time. And uh, during the course of all of that, you can easily imagine uh, so many uh, gave up, thinking that maybe it would never happen. But then there were many, thank God, who were faithful, faithful, and believed that God would one day deliver us from this evil, this hell. Uh -huh. And after 246 years, it took a long time, it happened. And we did it ourselves in large measure, even though the white say it was Lincoln and the Union Army, but African-American soldiers, free slaves, freed African-American men were yes. major contributors to the victory of the United States against the Confederate States of America. So it's possible. Yes, Yes, it, the Electoral College should definitely be dissolved. There's no question about it. And there are calls, increasing calls uh, to abandon it, to get rid of it, like Hillary Clinton. She won the popular vote. She lost the Electoral College to Trump. So it's not major news, but she's asking for and has asked, asked or appealed that the Electoral College be dissolved. Okay, okay. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, this past election, what was the threat 
Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, this past election, what was the threat? What was in the terms threat? Of, yeah. What? <laughs> well, the threat was not to the system itself. Trump himself was a billionaire. So <laughs> he's not a threat to change the, uh, uh, the prevailing ec economy, the prevailing governance. Um, Trump's threat uh, has more to do with um, uh, uh, racism, um, make America great again, make America a white country again, in the way that it was. Um, that's not possible. We're free and we're going to stay free. Uh, even though um, we rightfully say that the African-American vote um, uh, was decisive or certainly important in uh, defeating him, um, uh, our people will continue to vote and our people will continue to vote in ever increasing numbers because we know that it makes a difference. And here in Georgia, um, our people are, are far less fearful of whites today than we once were when America was so called great. Um, and when elections were stolen right and left, um, it's not possible to do that today uh, because the people refuse to accept it. Uh, so Trump's threat, I think, like I said earlier, um, represent uh, uh, an effort to uh, reassert uh, white people's dominance in the way in which they had uh, have, have done so in the past. The United States surely is in crisis, no question about that. The people who support him, uh, millions of people who, white people who support him, um, they see America on the challenge from China, uh, not just uh, America, China is a, a real threat, not just to the United States, but all the European countries, all the Western countries, the white countries, so to speak. Um, and this is something new. Over the last 500 years, the, Europe, the Western countries have dominated the world. That's ending. And China is in the lead on that. That's why it is, there's this tremendous effort by the United States government uh, to punish China. <laughs> but mm. China is very, very strong. Okay, okay. We have another question from Alex. Um, uh, since both Republicans and Democrats alike are in the business of adhering to the principles of electoral college, then what option do we really have? Should we even vote? Our, so many of our ancestors died for the right to vote. So if nothing else, even, even if nobody ever counted our votes, to honor our ancestors, we should vote. They sacrificed so much to make sure that we have the right to vote. And having a right to vote makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It can make a difference. So we absolutely must vote. Like I said earlier, for $15 an hour minimum wage, if I have the chance to vote for that, if each of us have a chance, has a chance to vote for that, wouldn't we vote? What goes on, so the voting is absolutely essential. And our history demonstrates that it's absolutely essential. Here, just as an example, during the Reconstruction era, just in Alabama, 180,000 African-American men were registered to vote. This is after slavery. In the Reconstruction period, lasted from the end of slavery, 1865, till this compromise between Hayes and Tilden in 1877, just 10, 11 years. 180,000 African-American men were registered to vote in Alabama. When Hayes and Tilden used the Electoral College to end Reconstruction, the number of African-American men registered to vote went down to 3,000. 3,000 from 180,000 to 3,000. And so why is all this effort to restrict the voting? Why not make voting easy? 
I make it difficult because it matters. And we can end the electoral college. We can dissolve the electoral college. First of all, we got to know. Know the history. Know the truth. And push for change. And part of the push, part of the mechanism for pushing change is voting. It's not the only mechanism, but it's an essential mechanism in the United States. I'd like to add, if I may, uh, also with that, that's why it's important for us to have the felons' rights restored to vote. That was another way that they utilized tools to be able to put, uh, with mass incarceration, to put thousands and hundreds of thousands of us out of the voting arena, even, even if we don't do time, <laughs> you can exactly. still be classified as a felon. Right. So that's another piece that I think we need to address. And the other thing is, is that we need to also make sure that not only do we vote in the federal elections, but local elections. We mm -hmm. can turn things upside down locally right. and in our let states. Me, right. let, let me say too that uh, there were three uh, constitutional amendments after the Civil War, um, 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment. The 13th Amendment uh, is the amendment to the Constitution that freed us. The 14th Amendment, uh, when I was in law school, the emphasis on the 14th, 15th, the 14th Amendment was the due process clause of the Constitution. The real essence of that 14th Amendment also is birthright citizenship. You know, the Trump always made such a big argument and still continues to make a big argument. He and his supporters, there should not be birthright citizenship in the United States. Being born in the United States shouldn't entitle a person to be a citizen of the United States. Well, why was that even enacted? That gave us citizenship. We were not citizens, even though we were free. So here are millions of us in the United States. So the 14th Amendment said, okay, they were born here, therefore they're citizens. So that's where that comes from. But the 13th Amendment should also be changed, not to make a slave. But the 13th Amendment has a provision that says that the slaves are now free. But slavery can exist in the prison system that is for punishment. I don't know the exact wording, but take a look at it and you'll see that also has to change. That's right. Like I said, not to change the make us slaves again. No, that stays. But there's language that still allows enslavement in the United States in the prison system. All right. Well, thank you, Attorney Bennett. Thank you so much. Um, you have just provided us with a wealth of knowledge. Um, I yeah, let me let's let's give the let's give the applause. I mean, thank you so much for taking your time to be on this program. Um, yeah, I could just sit in and pick your brain all day if, if you would allow it. <laughs> but, you know, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, Pastor Rogers, he, he had a little technical issue and he dropped. OK, I think he's coming back in. <laughs> OK, thank you. And uh, he thank had you. to drop off, but he's right back in. So, yeah, okay. we, certainly we thank you so much for being on being a part of this program. This has been a true blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. And uh, um, I'm Seventh-day Adventist too, and been Seventh-day Adventist for a long time and many, many years. And uh, Pastor Rogers gave me such a glowing uh, introduction, but he mentioned, I uh, for, forgot to mention one part, and that is I was a Sabbath, before moving to Atlanta, I was a Sabbath school teacher for about 30 years. Wow, okay. <laughs> it's awesome. Right. <laughs> Well, we want to thank all of you for your help today and for joining us today. I want to thank Pastor McMillan as well. Um, any closing thoughts, Pastor McMillan, um, in terms of from the things that you've heard today? Any final words that you'd like to share? Well, I would thank God for an enlightened attorney that is looks like me and is part <laughs> of our family that's really concerned about these issues because too many of us are unwilling to speak truth to power and to be honest about this empire in which we live in. So I just want to thank you very much, uh, Attorney uh, Bennett and uh, 
and as well as you, Pastor Rogers, for having me, as well as you, Chaplain Hedden, as well. Thank you all so very much for the privilege mm -hmm. and opportunity of just being able to be be blessed with this refreshing tonight, this afternoon. You're welcome. You're welcome. I do have a final question um, for um, uh, uh, Mr. Bennett. Um, you know, many people um, can, some people can feel a sense of like, what's the use of voting and so forth when we look at electoral college as it relates to presidential election. But can you speak to the issue of the direct elections that are, the rest of the ballot covers? You know, while we have to trust that electoral college will work the way it's in doing the right thing, can you speak about the influence that our, the, the difference our votes make when it comes to direct elections, when it comes to the selection of our representatives in Congress and uh, legislatures and other issues that may be on the ballot as well? I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, well, I was saying that when people look at the Electoral College, one of the questions came, you know, why should we even vote? And you did mention that, but yeah, right. most of the other issues on the ballot, almost everything else is direct. Yeah, they elect so can you speak to the value of our votes in shaping what happens in our states and who represents us in Congress and all those other things? Voting is so essential, so fundamental. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, I mentioned the, the 180,000 registered African-American men during the uh, immediately after slavery in the state of Alabama. And yet the uh, former slave owners uh, went to tremendous violence to eliminate that, to reduce so much, to end that registration of African-American men vote, so that by 1901, there were only 3,000 registered African-American men to vote in the state of uh, Alabama. Why did they do that? If voting were not important, why would they seek to end it for us? When we are substantial numbers in the southern states, if we vote, we could be governors, we could be United States senators in big numbers. We could dominate in some state houses, state legislatures have huge numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important. And with that kind of power, it becomes much easier to dissolve the electoral college. It becomes much easier to expand the vote instead of restricting the vote. Why restrict the vote unless you're trying to protect the status quo? We're not interested in protecting the status quo. That's not in our benefit. We want to change. So we want to expand the vote. Mm -hmm. And so yes, vote by all means, like I said earlier, Voting is just one mechanism. Yes. There's the protests in the streets also. There are other ways to do it. And then on the inside, I mean, when I practiced law, it was important to have a black judge. Hmm. As Pastor McMillan said, somebody who looks like me. Amen. Important. Amen. So all along, all, all through the whole process, Every office, vote. Continue to vote for president. Mm -hmm. Continue Thank to you. vote for vice president. Don't hold Thank back. You. By no means. It's essential. If it were not for the African-American vote, Biden would not be president. Remember James Claiborne, Biden's campaign until he got to South Carolina when he was running for president, nominee? James Claiborne and the black people in South Carolina made him president made him the nominee, mm. and then further the rest of us made him the president. So, and he is aware of that. So it's essential that we vote by all means, not just to honor our ancestors, but to protect and maintain and preserve our own dignity and our future and the future of our children. We want to thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we want to thank everyone that has uh, tuned into this. Please share this uh, broadcast even with your friends and other people you know. Um, very, very informative. Um, I want to thank Pastor McMillan also for joining us, um, and we appreciate your ministry today. Um, if you'd be so kind to close us in prayer, we would really appreciate it. Loving and most gracious God, our Father, I want to thank you so much for 
Attorney Bennett and the awesome things that he shared as far as dealing with the Electoral College and the history of Black people in this nation when they had the privilege and opportunity of voting. I ask you, Lord, that your Holy Ghost will continue to rain down upon him, protect him and guide him. Bless Lord Chaplain Hayden as well and Pastor Rogers and may your Holy Spirit just bless the people of God as we do all we can to stand for righteousness and justice, which is the foundation of God's throne. And God, thank you for another day's journey and another Sabbath. And may the anointing of your presence sustain us until that great day when you will come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank okay. you. Um, the question is still, still coming in. Uh, we have another question here. Would it be possible to elect senators and Congress that could change the electoral college? Yeah, I just, I just spoke to that and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reemphasize what I said, absolutely. The more uh, senators we have, US senators we have that uh, look like us and even those who don't look like us, but to support the positions that we support, the better. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, <laughs> Uh, if Stacey Abrams can become the um, governor of Georgia this next election cycle, uh, my gosh, what a huge difference that would make, not just because she looks like us, but because she is, is in favor of the kind of change that will benefit our people. So, yes, uh, we should uh, continue to try to elect the um, U.S. senators and Congress people. Uh, these are people who have a voice. They have a platform. And uh, I mean, if they were to call for dissolution or ending the Electoral College, it becomes a topic, a public discussion. It's not even a matter of public discussion. We don't That's know right. what it means, don't know who these electors are. It's uh, arcane or mysterious. Why should it be? Hmm. So why not have a U.S. Senator? I don't know of any U.S. Senator who's calling for the dissolution of the Electoral College. But imagine if we had somebody like that, it becomes a matter of public debate. That's a step forward. Mm -hmm. Instead of everybody being confused about what it is and all these different laws and who these people are, uh, and nobody knows, nobody even questions or challenges it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we want to thank you all for joining us today. Hope that you have a wonderful evening and um, God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.